Some of them went to Jefferson's own personal, uh, into his own personal museum, Mount Cello. Uh, several of them went to the Philadelphia Academy of Sciences, where they are today. Next time you're in Philly, you can stop and see them a lot of them there. And, and strangely enough, a lot of them went to the Paris Museum of Natural History. Because Jefferson, having been a, uh, the ambassador to France before he was vice president, before he was president. Uh, anyway, back when he was ambassador to France, was made a fellow of, the, of, of, of that museum, and therefore felt that he had to do something. Uh, and, and therefore shipped them more bones from Big Bone Lake. So the Paris Museum uh, has got a tremendous collection uh, from, from, from northern Kentucky. Uh, anyway, what did Jefferson have in his collection? Uh, what did Clark send him? Well, lots and lots and lots of bones, more bones of mastodons, of mammoths, as has been recently also named in, 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 by, by Cuvier. But whoa! There were also other things in here that nobody had ever noticed before, or if they noticed them, and just set them aside. There was this bone. Well, actually, skull. We're looking at the rear view of skull. Uh, it has some attributes of an elk. It has other attributes of a moose. And wouldn't you know it, they call it an elk moose. <laughs> and wouldn't you know it, when later bones were found to kind of flat, not flesh out, to, to kind of build up, erect this animal uh, holistically, uh, it turns out to be an elk moose. Uh, but it was discovered first in Big Bone Lake, Kentucky. It's got the length of a moose, but it's got uh, the attributes, uh, especially the upper skeleton of an elk. Sometimes, sometimes it's called a stag moose, and uh, quite an animal. Extinct, by the way, just like the mammoths and mastodons, uh, coming extinct at, at about the same time. Most of these animals, it turns out, jumping ahead of the story, became extinct by that. Uh, in fact, back then, uh, there was, back then in 1807, 1808, folks, Jefferson still didn't believe in extinction. Still believed that these animals are walking around somewhere. We just haven't found them yet. Uh, and a lot, of, a lot of other folks agreed with Jefferson on, on that basis. But, hey, Clark had found a new species. Never previously found anywhere in the world. New science. Right here, the elephants. We weren't found yet. Also in the collection, from Clark, laid out in the East Room of the White House, with this animal with downturned horns. Um, not upturn like in a bison, but downturn. And uh, this looks like an animal that some people had seen before, those who had gone to the far north, the musk ox. And in fact, that's exactly what it was. But it's not the tundra musk ox that we know of, uh, that Jefferson knew of, etc. It was uh, an extinct musk, well, uh, musk ox that's extinct today, but obviously did go to the lick as well for salt, along with mastodons and mammoths and um, the, the elk moose. Uh, this is the woodland musk ox, or the uh, Harlan's musk ox, or the Helmington musk ox, it's got quite a few common names. Uh, and this is a female nursing a young here. Uh, you know, this you've seen this before, because you've been the museum center, uh, one, of the, one of the statues they have along the Ice Age Trail there. Uh, found first type specimen from from uh, Big Bone Lake, Kentucky. We're not done yet. Uh, Clark's collection also included this single bone, which was, excuse me, the single bone with the attached horn. Uh, the horn going upwards this time, obviously being a, a bison horn, this is the core of the horn, uh, when the horns are, are actually put on, it turns out you've got a horn spread there of 36 inches, much greater than the 24 inch spread of the modern bison. Uh, this turns it out to be the ancient bison, type specimen, type species from Big Bone Lake, Kentucky, the Clark Collection. Um, this animal is kind of interesting uh, because it's the um, ancestor of the modern bison. Uh, and in fact, with, with a lot more fossil collection in the past couple hundred years, you can just see a progression from this animal right to the modern bison. The progression primar primarily can be seen just in the uh, uh, shortening of the, the horn span, and also the entire body becoming smaller. The ancient bison was a bigger animal overall, uh, and through <coughs> geological, not through geological time, just uh, in the last, uh, within the last 15,000 years, has evolved into the modern bison. So here is proof at Big Bone Lake, Kentucky, 15 miles away from a creation museum of, uh, of evolution uh, taking place uh, because, because in addition to the ancient bison skulls, which were first skeletal parts, which were first found by Clark, uh, there, there are thousands of modern bison skulls in Big Bone Lake, Kentucky uh, because up to just 200 years ago, modern bison was in great numbers uh, going to that area. Uh, but we're not done yet. There was still a fourth new, this Clark is probably one of the most foremost, little known to even you folks who are paleontologists, uh, William Clark, Lewis and Clark fame, foremost paleontologist, vertebrate paleontologist, because his, his collection of big bone lake also included a fourth new species to science, 
That's a horse. Many of you would guess that, but it's not the modern horse. It's a com complex to the horse, uh, named for the shape of the teeth. Horse that has since become extinct. Uh, there were actually quite a few different horse species uh, in North America, all of them becoming extinct. And only lately, when I say lately, about 400, 500 years ago, the conquistadors brought it back with them. Uh, this is from Spain, and, and they have finally returned to the continent on which the horse evolved, uh, which was right here. But the first evidence of this, of any horse uh, in North America, uh, fossil horse, ancient horse, whatever you say, was William Clark's collection, uh, Big Bone Lake, Kentucky. Well, what a guy. But, but he wasn't the last. Uh, other collectors, not necessarily as famous uh, and, and, and not as lucky, perhaps, uh, in finding more species because, you know, Clark had done such a, a great job here, but, but not, that's not to say they didn't come up with any, every, anything. Uh, parts of this very strange skull appeared uh, in later collections in the 1820s. Uh, that's, that is a strange looking animal. What the hell's name that could be? That could be a ground sloth, uh, Jefferson's ground sloth. So named because uh, Thomas Jefferson was in on the original finding of this animal, which was in a cave in Virginia. So this animal, even though it was also a big bone in Kentucky, uh, it had been found previous to that, back in the late 1700s, uh, in, and named, in fact, uh, in an early scientific paper by, by Thomas Jefferson. On the other hand, another brown slot, then found a couple years later, turned out to be different. Uh, this is Harlan's ground slot, and it's bigger. It's 11 feet long. Jefferson's ground slot's a mere 9 feet in length. This, this big 11 foot uh, fella, more of a grassland uh, dweller with those giant uh, uh, claws probably going to the roots uh, underneath the grassland. Anyway, the first evidence of this animal was Big Bone Lake, Kentucky, and of course, since then, it's probably the most common animal coming out of La Brea Tar Pits, uh, for those of you who've been out there in, in the LA area. Um, so, so here we have another new species to science. Uh, Big Bone Lick is you know, becoming so famous that Charles Lyell, the founder of modern geology, he had to stop by here in 1842, collect a few bones for himself, uh, take a look at, at the lay of the land uh, where all these amazing things have been coming from. Uh, and after the Civil War, uh, among other people showing up here, I'm just jumping ahead quickly, Nathaniel Shaler, head of paleontology at Harvard University, came out found everything that we've already talked about tonight, but in addition noted that uh, bones of animals that weren't extinct were also mixed in, uh, moose and caribou. Now, this is kind of interesting because uh, Daniel Shaler jumped to the conclusion, you know, or at least came forth with the hypothesis that, hey, at least we know what the weather was like back when these animals were a big bone lake because we know where moose and caribou live, in colder areas. And, and so, Moose and caribou were here. Obviously, the mammoth and the mastodon and the complex toothed horse and all these other things, ground sloths, uh, obviously were also animals of a colder period. Uh, so that's interesting because it's one of our first hints that there had been periods in, in, in Cincinnati regional history and North American history which were colder than, than the present time. Uh, of course, scientists right at this uh, institution we're sitting in tonight uh, in the 20th century, started figuring out, yeah, it had been colder, so cold, in fact, there have been a series of glaciers which have made it in here. Uh, the one that got further south, in fact, even covered over the lake completely, the pre-Illinoian glacier, uh, got into northern Kentucky about a million years ago. These are all guesstimates, estimates at best. Uh, more recently, the Illinoian glacier, about a quarter of a million years ago, uh, you know, barely got into a little bit of northern Kentucky. Um, got, got to just about where you're sitting, in fact probably uh, one of the boundaries of, of the great Illinois and ice sheet uh, of about a quarter million years ago. The last, uh, the last great glacial advance was known as the Wisconsin Glacier uh, of a mere 20,000 years ago. Uh, and even though it started melting back about 19,000 years ago, still there's evidence that it was uh, you know, in Ohio up until much more recently than that. And it was probably still cool here, the ice age as we call it, up, up until about 10,000 years ago. The Wisconsin and Glacier is the interesting one because that matches the radiocarbon dating of the bones. Jumping ahead to the 1960s, the University of Nebraska shows up here uh, for four years in Big Bone Lake, Kentucky, collects a lot of bones there and has some radiocarbon dating. 
which of course was something that none of these previous scientists could do, and found out that these bones we've been looking at and talking about tonight uh, have been 17,000 years old, 16,000 years old, 14,000 years old, 12,000 years old. So we now know when these animals live here. Um, you know, uh, there are a lot of other mysteries surrounding them still, but at least we, we have some idea of when they were here. The University of Nebraska folks also, being the geologists that they 